it is to have you join us here today. We're going to head over to Hope Sabbath School with Derek Morris for our lesson study. Welcome to Hope Sabbath School, an in-depth interactive study of the Word of God. I'm excited today because we're in the middle of a great series on the book of Genesis, the first book of the Pentateuch, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Moses writes down incredible stories from the beginning all the way through now. We're in the time of Jacob, and I'm excited because one of our team members, Brittany, will be leading our study today, Jacob the Supplanter. But it's good news, too, because God is going to change his life. So I'm glad you're with us. And by the way, if you've not been with us for the series, go back to our website, hopetv.org slash hopess. Watch the whole series. While you're there, you can download the same outline that Brittany will be using. We've all got it here. And our, our prayer is that you'd be inspired to start a study group in your area. In fact, this whole series on Genesis is just by our team teachers. And that's really great. I get to sit on the stool and be one mm -hmm. of the participants. But we'd like to challenge you to start a study in your area. We also have a free gift for you, by the way, and that is the wonderful book, Patriarchs and Prophets. You can just go to our website, hopetv.org slash hopess. Click on the free gift button, and it's available in more than 20 languages or an audio book. It's a companion. The first 21 chapters deal with the book of Genesis, and you'll really be blessed. So lots of good things happening here. Welcome to the team. We're glad you're here. And welcome to our remote uh, team members joining us. Shana joining us again from Maine. Good to see you, Shana. Always good to have you on the team. And Toronto, well, that's Rodney joining us from Toronto. Glad you're with us again, Rodney. And God bless you as we share the Word of God together. But well, we're going to discover today that the Lord Most High is awesome, Amen. as Brittany leads us in a study of Jacob the supplanter. Amen. Let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you for how you have been teaching us and guiding us through the book of Genesis. Thank you for all the lessons that we've learned. Amen. And Lord, we know that you have more that you want to reveal to us today. And so we just pray that our hearts and our minds would be open mm -hmm. through the power of your Holy Spirit, yes. that we can learn what you want to teach us mm -hmm. and that it would not only transform our lives, but we would be able to share that with someone else. Mm -hmm. We ask all these things in your precious name, dear Jesus. Amen. 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 Well, have any of you been an answer to someone's prayer? Mm. I hope each one of us can say yes to that question. Um, but in our story today, we're going to find that Jacob was actually an answer to his parents' prayer. Mm -hmm. And let's start in Genesis, our study together today. And we're going to be studying in Genesis chapter 25. And we're going to start with verses 21 to 23. And I'll ask Jason to start us off with that passage, and we're going to see how God had a plan and how Jacob's parents were actually seeking after his plan. And so please read that for us, Jason. I have the New King James Version, which says in Genesis chapter 25, verses 21 through 23, Now Isaac pleaded with the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his plea. And Rebekah his wife conceived, but the children struggled together within her. And she said, If all is well, why am I like this? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separated from your body. One people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. Thank you, Jason. So what supernatural occurrence do we see um, here in this text? Anyone? Yes, Nisha. So first of all, there's a barren woman who is now conceiving. Uh -huh. um, and then second of all, God is talking to that woman who is <laughs> yeah. um, and, and tells her uh, that her children uh, about her children. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. So there's a miracle happening, right? I believe every birth is a miracle, right? That God wove us together in our mother's wombs is an amazing miracle. Yep. But this is a special, um, even beyond that, because there's a prophecy that's mentioned. Rodney, you had something to share. And you're right, Brittany. I'm just following up on Nisha's point there, because the, the backstory, the, the quick backstory is that Abraham wanted to ensure that Isaac had someone from his homeland. And there comes Rebecca uh, to, to Isaac. They got married. And essentially now, uh, Rebecca was supposed to be the, the woman through, through which the promise, the promise uh, should be executed. But here she is, she's barren. Mm. And so uh, you see Isaac here pleading to the Lord. One version says, beseeching the Lord. And the Lord answered Isaac's prayer, not only with one son, but with two. Yes. Thank you, yes. Rodney, for bringing that backstory to our mind because God has made promises, right? Mm -hmm. And what we learned last time, God always keeps his promises. When God makes a promise, we can guarantee it will be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. And so we see that um, Isaac is pleading to God and these twins are an answer to his prayer. And it's interesting as I was studying about this, um, there's actually seven other people in the Bible who were, there was a prophecy about them before they were born. Mm -hmm. um, many of them we've studied and heard about before. Isaac was one, Ishmael was another one, um, Solomon, Josiah, Cyrus, John the Baptist, and finally Jesus. Each of them were mentioned by name before they were born. Mm -hmm. And here we don't have Jacob mentioned by name, but um, there's a plan for his life already mentioned before mm -hmm. his birth. Mm -hmm. um, and we just see God has a plan. And when we seek him, we will find out what that plan is Amen. for our lives. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, we want to find out about these twins. There's this prophecy given when they're first uh, conceived, right? Um, but what is this uh, prophecy about and how does it come to fulfillment? So let's read, continue in Genesis 25, verses 24 through 27. And I'm going to ask if Rodney would read that for us. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. So when her days were fulfilled for her to give birth... Indeed, there were twins in her womb, and the first came out red. He was like a hairy garment all over, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out, and his hand took hold of Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. So the boys grew. And Esau was a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a mild man dwelling in tents. Thank you, Rodney. So in what ways were these twins different? Um, I've met many twins throughout my life, and many times we think, oh, you know, they look the same, especially if they're identical twins. You know, they have so many features that look exactly alike. They must be the same in their personality as well. Mm -hmm. But pretty much every set of twins that I've ever met is very different in their personality and sometimes in their looks. Now, what are some of the differences that the Bible brings out about Jacob and Esau? Mm -hmm. Yes, Stephanie. Their occupation was different. Mm -hmm. Occupation is definitely one. Yes, Jason. What's the physical aspect of them? You know, one was hairy and one was not. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Definitely, that's another difference. Nisha. And just the temperament. So Stephanie mentioned the the, the occupations are different, but within those occupations, you also can see their temperament. You mm -hmm. have someone who's in the field who's a hunter, so there's a bit more of an adventurer um, there, and then you have someone who stays close to home and in the tents, and perhaps might be more contemplative. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Very different. Yes. I have a Derek. confession to make. <laughs> I, I always thought this word mild was like just kind of a, you know, kind of a kind of person, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but but that word is actually used uh, for Noah mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. is used of Job like blameless. Uh, mm -hmm. My my Bible in the margin here it translates it literally as complete. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. So I think I misunderstood. I mean, maybe he was not as aggressive like a hunter brother. Yeah. But it, it's not a criticism of him mm -hmm. when he's he's called. I don't know what other translations have besides mine, which just says mild. Mm -hmm. But I kind of grew up that he, thinking he was just kind of a very kind of I don't know weak, maybe yeah. mm -hmm. not 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 really the kind of person I would I would think would be really 
someone a man would want to be like. Mm -hmm. Maybe mm -hmm. there's something in that word that's more than we mm -hmm. see at first. Yes, thank you for bringing that up, Pastor Derek. And there are many examples in the scriptures mm -hmm. using that same Hebrew word um, that helps us understand more about it. Um, and you've mentioned some of the people who were called after that, Job and Noah. And when it talks about them, it says they were perfect. Mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, that's a high calling. Yeah. Um, and so this idea of perfect perfection or completeness or wholeness. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be talking more about his moral character yep. rather than his physique or his features. Yeah. Um, that it's, it's looking at his heart. And God sees that, um, you know, this, this one is going to be the one to carry on this godly lineage. Mm -hmm. um, and it was even prophesied. Mm -hmm. So beautiful insights. Now, we find that when we read this story, there's some dysfunction in this family. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we think, oh, it's such a happy family. You know, they found this beautiful wife, Rebecca, who's godly for Isaac, who's also godly. Now they have twins that were much prayed for. Actually, when you read the story, you find that they prayed for these twins and it took 20 years mm -hmm. uh, before they had children. They were t 20 years that she was barren before she gave birth. So um, these were much prayed for children. Mm -hmm. And um, now there's actually some dysfunction in this godly home. Is that possible? Mm. Well, we're going to read a little bit more about it. Um, let's read in Genesis chapter 25, verses 28 through 34. And I'm going to ask Harold to read that for us. Mm -hmm. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it reads, And Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Now Jacob cooked a stew, and Esau come in, came in from the field, and he was weary. And Esau said to Jacob, Please feed me with that same red stew, for I am weary. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, Sell me your birthright as of this day. And Esau said, Look, I am about to die, so what is this birthright to me? Then Jacob said, Swear to me as of this day. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. And Jacob gave Esau bread and stew of lentils. Then he ate and drank, arose, and went his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Thank you, Harold. Yeah. So what are some of these dysfunctions we see in this supposedly godly home that's supposed to be fulfilling the promise eventually down the line. Sabina. I think the first one that we see here is that parents, they are preferring a child to mm. the other. So we see that, you know, uh, Isaac loved Esau while Rebecca loved Jacob. Mm -hmm. And apparently this rivalry that the parents, the, this preference of the parents transferred to the children mm -hmm. because it looks like there is some rivalry there. Mm -hmm. Even to the point that when one, one, one of them is, is starving and hungry, the other one, instead of just giving the food kindly, instead mm -hmm. want to trade the birthrights, which for me indicates that there is jealous, jealousy and mm -hmm. rivalry between mm -hmm. them also. Mm -hmm. So favoritism that leads to jealousy and then this competition between the, the brothers. Travis. So I see some dysfunction in Jacob as well because it seems like he must have known the promise that the older would serve the younger and he's looking um, for a way to deceive his brother. I mean, you just, uh, you're just not going to come up with um, stealing the birthright in a moment's notice. It seems like he had to have been contemplating how he could get that birthright from Esau. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up, Travis. And Jason? This reminds me a little bit of Jacob's uh, grandfather, Abram. Uh, Abraham, always wanting to kind of try to do things his own way. So mm -hmm. Jacob is here. He's thinking, all right, now we, we have God's promise here, but how can I help God fulfill his promise? Mm -hmm. And that makes me think a lot of uh, his grandpa, Abraham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We see that these family traits are passed down from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. So we do need to be careful. Uh, our own choices do have a ripple effect. Um, thank you for bringing out that point, Jason. Um, I have a question. What is a birthright and why was it so significant? Um, we know, yeah, birthright is the order of birthright. The oldest usually gets the birthright. But what is the significance of a birthright anyhow? Why would Jacob be wanting this? Um, why would Esau just carelessly give it away? Um, what is this birthright? Yes, Nisha. Uh, so I think there are a couple of things with it. One, it indicates some sort of wealth that you're going to get. There's also uh, some sort of uh, spiritual preeminence. You're also the priest of the family. Mm -hmm. um, so there are a couple of things that are um, 
uh, given th through this. And also we know that the, for, the, for this particular birthright, it's the one through which um, the Redeemer is going to come through. Yeah. Um, so uh, the person to whom this is given, uh, there's also significance down the line for descendants to come as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nisha. That's so important to remember that it's not just, oh, you're going to have the inheritance when your father passes away, but you actually have the responsibility to lead your family spiritually, to be like the priest of the family, and the promises are coming through your children to lead up to the Messiah, um, which is so important. Now, it's interesting to me how Esau just kind of flippantly gives it away. He doesn't say, well, you know, I think we should trade something more significant, not just a pot of soup. He's just like, sure, I'll, I'll make the trade. Um, and Hebrews gives us a little more insight into Esau's character and why he may have done that. And so we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to ask Shana to read that for us in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 14 through 17. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Lest there be any fornicator or profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his birthright. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently with tears. Thank you, Shana. Wow, we find some interesting uh, characteristics about Esau now, after the fact. Um, what do we learn about Esau from these passages? Yes, Jason. When the passage is said profane, and that word in the margin says godless. Mm -hmm. godless. And so it's like he didn't have a relationship like his brother did with God. So therefore, as he looked at his birthright and saying in scripture, I'm about to die, it's kind of like, I don't care, and mm -hmm. kind of just gave it away because yeah. of that. Yeah, so he didn't have that connection with God mm -hmm. that we see Jacob had, yeah. um, and he just was thinking more about the things of this world. Birth, well, yeah. um, you know, temporally, I'm gonna die, so what is a birthright to me? Yeah. Um, rather than, God can take care of me, there's other places I can get food, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so yeah, we see this about his character, which is interesting to note, um, and why maybe God had already known ahead of time mm. in this prophecy, the younger one is going to be the one to carry on this godly heritage. Yes, Harold. Mm. Well, it's kind of interesting because Esau was a hunter, and not only that, there was probably food around the house as well. So it's like, what kind of character is this? It's like, mm -hmm. you're just thinking about the moment. You just mm -hmm. want it now and then, and that's it. It's like not realizing, hey, you know, let me think about what I'm, the decision I'm making. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't contemplate, he, he doesn't like, think before, like, it's like he acts before he thinks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of interesting that. Yeah, important yeah. lessons for us. Well, we're going to continue on. We're going to see how um, just the characters of these two brothers plays out in the next part of the story. Um, and we're going to look at Jacob's deception and his restoration. So let's continue in Genesis chapter 27. We're going to be reading verses 1 through 17, and I'm going to ask Stephanie to read that for us and find out some important insights, um, kind of going back to how God makes a promise. Are we going to trust that promise? Or are we going to take things into our own hands? Hmm. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were so dim that he could not see, that he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, and he answered him, Here I am. Then he said, Behold now, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now therefore, please take your weapons, your quiver and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and make me savory food such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat that my soul may bless you before I die. Now Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to Esau, his son. And Esau went to the field to hunt game and to bring it. So Rebekah spoke to Jacob, her son, saying, Indeed, I heard your father speak to Esau, your brother, saying, Bring me game and make savory food for me, that I may eat it and bless you in the presence of the Lord before my death. Now, therefore, my son, obey my voice. 
according to what I command you. Go now to the flock and bring me from there two choice kids of the goats, and I will make savory food from them for your father, such as he loves. Then you shall take it to your father that he may eat it and that he may bless you before his death. And Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Look, Esau, my brother, is a hairy man, and I'm a, I am a smooth-skinned man. Perhaps my father will feel me, and I shall seem to be a deceiver to him, and I shall bring a curse on myself and not a blessing. But his mother said to him, Let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go, get them for me. And he went and got them and brought them to his mother, and his mother made savory food, such as her father, his father loved. Then Rebekah took the choice clothes of her elder son Esau, which were with her in the house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And she put the skins of the kids of the goats on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. Then she gave the savory food and the bread, which she had prepared into the hand of her son, Jacob. Thank you, Stephanie. So what are some of the important insights we learn about this deceptive plan? Yes, Jason. It kind of seems like um, Jacob didn't want to do it at first, you know, mm. dealing with, because he asked his mother, like, you know, won't I be a, found a deceiver? you know, because my brother's hairy, I'm not. And so it kind of seemed like, you know, that character that we were talking about mm -hmm. was kind of coming up at that, you know, but sadly he hearkened to his mother's voice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's an important point. Yeah. Um, yes, Stephanie. And just to tag along with what Jason is saying, he wasn't questioning whether or not God would see him as a deceiver, mm -hmm. but only what will I look like to my, my earthly father? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a great point. Mm -hmm. Jason. And his earthly father is apparently um, forgetting or not following God's guidance mm -hmm. there because uh, he's asking Esau to go uh, bring this food to do the birthright. It's like Isaac is, again, almost still, I don't know, deceptively trying to go against God, but Isaac still has his own plan. It's kind of like both parents have their own plan mm -hmm. and they're going to try to fulfill their own plan mm -hmm. regardless of what God says. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they're ignoring the prophecy. They're ignoring, well, one of them is trying to fulfill the prophecy in her own way right, right, and yeah. the other one's ignoring the prophecy and trying to make what they want to happen. Yes, Rodney and then Travis. Yeah, this is very troubling for me. And um, what I'm seeing is a trend. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, you see uh, it in Abram back in the day, previous to, to this narrative, where he lied about Sarah. You see Sarah trying to have her own way and, and the cause of Ishmael. And then you see, you, you, do, you just kind of see a trend here, that mm -hmm. it, it, the, the trend of deception, mm -hmm. um, trying to trying to get to the end goal that wa God wants to get to without God's help. Mm. And it is, it's a lesson for us, really, because if we don't, if we don't place our trust in, in God, we're going to go and do our own thing as we see these characters in the Bible doing, and we're going to get ourselves in trouble as, as, as they did. But thank, thanks be to God that he has a way <laughs> of helping us to, to, right. to, to, to get to the point where we realize that we need to trust in him. Yes, yeah. thank you, mm -hmm. Rodney. What a wonderful point. And Travis? Well, it seems to me that this is uh, premeditated because um, we learned earlier Isaac loved um, Esau and Rebecca loved Jacob, and then um, Jacob's trying to steal the birthright, and, and now she's listening um, to the conversation that Isaac is having with Esau, and it seems like she even has the clothes ready. Like they're, they're, she's setting the stage to make all this happen. And I just thought, what discontentment, uh, what dysfunction, really, from the time these children are born up until now? Um, it seems like through the whole thing, there's been this wrestling with um, what's going to happen instead of just letting God work through it the way He promised mm -hmm. He would. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
I really would love to see one day when we get to heaven and we can ask God, how are you going to fulfill this plan? It would, <laughs> I would love to see what would have been, right? Uh, um, rather than what actually took yeah, place. Right. But um, the good news is that God still works with broken people and yeah, that yeah. he still fulfills his promises in his way, um, even when we mess up, even when we make mistakes. So we can see God's mercy and his grace in his dealings with this family. Mm -hmm. um, now, if we continue on in the story, just for the sake of time, would someone like to summarize for us what actually happened? So um, Rebecca gives this advice to her son Jacob. She tells him exactly what he should do each and every step. Um, does he follow through with this advice? Does he say, yes, I'm going to do this, mother? Or does he say, no, I'm not going to di um, disobey God? Yes. So I, I would challenge that word advice. I think she's commanding mm -hmm. him to do it. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and back to what was said earlier, yeah. it's, it's actually her plan of deception. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I pray to God we wouldn't have parents who would try to push us yeah. in plans of deception, mm -hmm. that we'd have the courage to say, no, I'm going to wait on God's mm -hmm. timing. But uh, the, wow. she also reads something into that story. She said that, that her husband said he's going to bless him in the Lord. Mm. And, and she never, he never said that. He said, I just want to bless you. Right. So maybe the blessing Jacob wanted to give to Esau was a blessing he could mm. give to any son, but not the blessing because mm. later, the, first, the blessing for the firstborn, he does give to Jacob mm. after the whole mm -hmm. deception is over. Mm -hmm. It's like you could have taken out this whole mm -hmm. messy story mm -hmm. right. yes. and okay. God's plan would have been fulfilled. That's right, mm -hmm. that's right. Great yes. point, Pastor Derek. Mm -hmm. Now let's continue on. Um, would someone summarize what actually happened? Rodney, would you be willing to do that for us um, just for the sake of time and, and continuing on in the story? What did Jacob do and, and what happened next? Well, he executed the plan of his mother to the letter T, uh, meaning he executed it according to uh, what she said. She, he gave uh, his father, he, uh, Jacob gave his father, Isaac, the, the stew. Um, Isaac blessed him because Isaac thought Jacob was really Esau because he placed this the skin of the animal on, on him and Isaac felt him and said, okay, yes, this is my son Esau, and he blessed him. And then the story came out to the entire family. Esau found out um, about the, what, what happened to, to Jacob. And then Rebecca, his mother, said to Jacob, I am going to ask you, please, to flee quickly <laughs> for your life. Flee to my, my brother Laban. Mm -hmm. And again, we'll see further down in the story, speaking about deception. Mm. You also see the same deception with Laban. I know we're not there yet in the story, but it's just, mm. it's just unbelievable that when we, when we come off the track that God is leading us, it can really lead us to the path of destruction. Yes, thank you mm -hmm. for that summary, um, Rodney. So he actually deceives his father. His father asks him on three different occasions, are you really Esau? And yeah. he says, yes, I am. He doesn't deny it. Mm -hmm. um, he goes through with it. And, um, and then we see that Esau actually comes in right after Jacob left and finds out what his brother has done. And I want us to read Esau's response um, in Genesis chapter 27, verses 30 to 41. And I'm going to ask Sabina to read that for us. Okay, from 30 to 41. I'll be reading from the New King James Version, and it says, Now it happened as soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, and Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, that Esau, his brother, came in from his hunting. He also had made savory food and brought it to his father and said to his father, Let my father arise and eat of his son's game, that your soul may bless me. And his father Isaac said to him, Who are you? So he said, I am your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled exceedingly and said, Who? Where is the one who hunted game and brought it to me? I ate all of it before you came, and I have blessed him, and indeed he shall be blessed. When Esau heard the words of his father, he cried with an exceedingly great and bitter cry, and said to his father, Bless me also, O my father. But he said, your brother came with deceit and has taken away your blessing. And Esau said, Is he not rightly named Jacob? For he has supplanted me this two times. He took away my birthright, and now look, he has taken away my blessing. And he said, 
have you not reserved a blessing for me? And then Isaac answered and said to Esau, Indeed, I have made him your master, and all his brethren I have given to him as servants, with grain and wine I have sustained him. What shall I do now for you, my son? And Esau said to his father, Have you only one blessing, my father? Bless me, me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Then Isaac his father answered and said to him, Behold, your dwelling shall be of the fatness of the earth and of the dew of heaven from above. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. And it shall come to pass, when you become restless, that you shall break his yoke from your neck. Thank you, Sabina. Wow, um, what a interaction that happened afterwards. Um, Esau is very disappointed. Um, and then actually right after that, um, verse 41, set, um, would you read, continue a little bit further? I wanna see how um, Esau responds after this blessing from his father. Yes, so, so I'll be reading verse 41 and it says, So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are at hand. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Mm. Mm. Wow, so we see not only is he disappointed, but now he's making a plan in his heart that I'm gonna retaliate, I'm gonna get back at this brother who stole this blessing from me. Mm. Um, as soon as my father's dead, mm. I'm gonna take things into my own hands and I'm going to kill my brother. Mm. Wow, we see kind of the way that sin leads us, right? It always leads to destruction and death. Mm. Harold, you had a comment you wanted to add. It's interesting because technically the blessing did not come from Isaac directly. Mm. At the end of the day, all the blessing comes from God. Mm. So. It's just like, it's just, you can see how like uh, earthly minded, uh, mm -hmm. because I know that um, in Hebrews 12, we read that Esau was considered profane or godless. So he even wasn't even thinking about spiritual godly things. He was just thinking about the temporary, the earthly things. Mm -hmm. And this is actually revealed. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he said that um, Jacob took or, or stole uh, his birthright, actually he sold it to him. So mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting that he even is lying. Yeah. So. It's, it's all a mess in there. Yes, lots of dysfunction. <laughs> um, and right after this, um, Rebecca also hears this and says, you know, we have to do something about this. I have to protect my son. Um, and she actually talks to her husband, um, Isaac, and says, we need to send him back to my family so he can find a godly wife. Mm -hmm. um, and this will preserve his life from, mm -hmm. from J our Esau trying to kill him. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happens. Jacob is sent away. And I find it interesting in the passage we read earlier um, where Jacob was questioning his mother saying, um, you know, won't, um, won't my father curse me instead of bless me? And she said, let the curse be on me. me. Well, actually, we find that he never sees the face of his mother again. Mm -hmm. When he's sent away to go find a wife, we find later on the story when he returns, his mother has already passed away. Mm -hmm. So she did have, um, by, by that deception, it did lead to mm -hmm. um, great uh, pain mm -hmm. in her life. She never saw that favored son right. again. Um, now let's con continue on because um, while things look hopeless and it seems like this family that's supposed to be the one that the, the Messiah is coming through is, is not godly, is not following his plans, um, we see that God still is working with this family, still working with Jacob, and he meets him as he's leaving his home. He's probably in fear. My brother wants to kill me. My father's gonna die. I don't know if I'm gonna see my family again. I have to go to this place I've never been. I don't know how I'm gonna find a wife. He probably has um, guilt and remorse on him from the deception that he's played. Um, and we see God meets him there in all of that pain and all of that guilt and all of that burden. And let's go there to Genesis 28 verses 10 through 15. And I'm gonna ask Nisha to read that for us. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Now Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head. And he lay down in that place to sleep. Then he dreamed and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. 
and its top reached to heaven, and there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to your, you and your descendants, and your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east, to, to the north and to the south, and in you and in your seed all the families of earth shall be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken to you. Mm. Amen. Wow, mm -hmm. can you imagine how Jacob must have felt? Mm. Yeah. He sees this vision of God himself mm. and, and he sees God, he hears God speaking to him saying, right. I'm going to be with you wherever you go right. and I'm going to fulfill my promise. Mm -hmm. I will bring you back to this place. Your descendants will be blessed and be a blessing to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, I can't imagine how Jacob must have felt, okay, if God is with me, I can, I can leave yeah. and I know that he's going to guide me. Mm -hmm. um, what hope. Now, this ladder that he saw, um, in the New Testament, we find a wonderful revelation of what this ladder is a symbol of. And let's go to John chapter 1, verse 51. And I'm going to ask if Rodney would read that for us. John chapter 1, verse 51. And I'm reading from the New King James Version. And he said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, Hereafter you shall see heaven open." and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Mm. And this is Jesus speaking this, right? That's He's right. talking about himself. He refers to himself as the Son of Man in the Gospels many times. So this ladder that um, Jacob saw in this dream was pointing forward to Christ. Yeah. He yeah. is our connection from heaven to earth. He is yeah. the only way to the Father. Mm -hmm. Because of his sacrifice, we can be reunited with God again. And so Jacob is seeing this, another picture of the gospel, just like his, his father um, Isaac experienced, right? Um, with the altar. Um, now he's getting another picture of the gospel um, hundreds of years before Jesus came. And I'm sure this is encouraging to him. Mm. Now, yes, you know, I see Derek. another picture of the immeasurable, unfailing love of God, mm -hmm. because God not only tells him cryptically, mm -hmm. Esau won't kill you, mm -hmm. because he says you're going to be blessed with descendants, mm -hmm. but he actually gives him a revelation mm -hmm. through this vision mm -hmm. of the gospel message. Mm -hmm. And so, Brittany, I just feel really encouraged today, yes. Amen. because probably someone's watching and says, I've done some of the same things. Mm -hmm. That's right. But there's always mercy and grace if we'll open our hearts to Amen. God. That's right. Thank yeah. you so much, Pastor Derek. Now, I have wonder if any of you have a time where you try to do things your own way, like we see in this family, um, and you realize it didn't work, and you repented, you came to Jesus, and he, he gave you comfort, he gave you mm -hmm. encouragement, and he gave you a new path. Um, kind of like Jacob experienced at this moment. Does anyone have a story that they would like to share of, of God meeting you? Um, yes, Travis. So I've often wondered, I mean, I know now why, but I often wondered, you know, in business, I would want to make, um, buy certain things, you know, sometimes they were quite a bit of money. And I thought that would be the best thing for my business. But I did proceed prayerfully most times. Mm -hmm. And and I wouldn't be able to buy them or something would fall through. And later on, um, something else would happen. And I would look back and say, had I bought that piece of equipment or that property or whatever, I would have been in huge trouble. Mm -hmm. And um, and I would just praise God. And then I wondered, well, why is he working that way? And then I think about how Jesus was, you know, to the fishermen, he would use fish. To the woman at the well, he would use water. Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking, I was a businessman and God knew how to get my attention. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just praise God because had he not interceded in so many different ways, um, I could have been uh, co completely unsuccessful in business. And that would have, you know, who knows what problems would have came from that. But mm -hmm. I saw God many times shut the doors that I thought for sure should have been opened for my success. Mm, thank you, Travis, for sharing. And Shana, we'd love to hear from you. I'm just thinking about, you know, I'm in, in a time in my life where I was pursuing a relationship with someone who the Lord did not ordain for me. And time after time, he was showing me 
you know, this is not the person that I intended for you. Mm-hmm. And it and it was like, you know, heartbreak after heartbreak with this individual. Mm-hmm. And, you know, God was always saying to me, there is a better way. This is not the way that I intended for you. Just, just, you know, go the other way. And it, it was after experiencing multiple heartbreaks that I just finally gave up and, and surrendered, mm-hmm. submitted myself to God's will. What, God, what do you want from me? Um, for my, you know, my partner, my, my spouse, because this, this is, a something that you want for me. Um, and it was after that ultimate surrender that he led me to my husband and, uh, it's the greatest thing, greatest gift that God has given to me. And if I had just surrendered and submitted to his will from earlier on, um, I wouldn't have, it would not have had to go through, you know, the heartbreaks and the pain that I had gone through earlier. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much, Shana. I'm sure there's many of our viewers who are watching who may be experiencing that right now. Mm-hmm. And if you'll just surrender, God has a beautiful plan um, to bring you to that partner who will be one that you can walk with to heaven, yeah. not someone who's going to take you away mm-hmm. um, from God. Well, so um, submit like Shana did. It's a wonderful blessing I've experienced in my own life as well. Well, we've got to continue on with the story. We see that um, Jacob ends up leaving his homeland. He goes to um, his mother's side of the family, and he actually um, works for his uncle for a period of time. And we're going to pick up the story in Genesis 29, verses 20 to 25. And I'm going to ask Jason if you would read that for us. Genesis 29, verses 20 through 25. All right. Genesis 29, 20 through 25. Yes. All right. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And the Bible says, So Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because the love he had for her. Then Jacob said to Levin, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled, that I may go into her. Verse 22. And Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. Now it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Jacob, and he went into her. And Leban gave his maid Zelpa to his daughter Leah as a maid. So it came to pass in the morning that behold, it was Leah. And he said to Leban, what is this you have done to me? What was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? Mm. Mm. (laughs) So what did Jacob experience as he's working for his uncle? Um, He actually requests Rachel um, to be his wife and and his father-in-law says, sure, work for me seven years. And he works for seven years. And then who does he receive on his wedding night? Leah. Leah, Leah, the older sister. Um, and he doesn't realize it till the morning. This is not the one that I was promised. <laughs> um, and, and then he says, you've deceived me. Mm-hmm. Wow. Why do you think God allowed this to happen? God could have prevented this from <laughs> happening. Why? Why did God allow this to happen, Nisha? Yeah, just, uh, gosh, it's so amazing uh, that Jacob experiences a taste of his own medicine. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. The thing that, yeah, and I don't know, and maybe he never really understood uh, the impact of that deception in God's eyes, um, and and it and this, there's no way this wasn't going to touch home. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the greatest deceit he could have, especially in someone that he loved and perhaps someone he trusted and worked for for this long, uh, to then wake up in the morning and then realize what had been done. In at some point, there must have been a oh, uh, I see what I also did um, in my past at some mm. point. So it was God's mercy so that um, that deceit would never be repeated again as mm. well. That's right. So sometimes. Um, God has to take us through difficult situations for us to learn um, that maybe that some of the things that we've been involved in or some of the things that we do are not of him and, and how it hurts those around us. Um, God doesn't want to hurt us, but he wants us to understand what we're doing to others and what we're doing to ourselves. Yeah. Um, and he used this circumstance to bring about some kind of revelation to Jacob mm-hmm. and and to help him be able to understand what he's done. And we see later on in, in Jacob's life that he does have a transformation. So this may have been one of those pivotal moments where a transformation started mm-hmm. to happen. We don't see it right away, right. Um, but later on we do. Pastor Derek. So I, I'm, I'm amazed that the Messiah comes through mm-hmm. Leah's children, mm-hmm. through Judah, right? Mm-hmm. So, so right. Mm-hmm. 
And yet God also brings a deliverer through Rachel's mm -hmm. son, Joseph. Mm -hmm. It just tells me that God is amazing mm -hmm. yes. and yes. that God, uh, even when we may uh, see all kinds of deception around, mm -hmm. that our loving God can still accomplish his purpose. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. God can do anything and he can take our brokenness and bring something good out of it. There's mm -hmm. so many um, insights we can learn. Travis, did you have a comment you wanted to make? Well, I would just like to say that sin is its own consequence. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible says in uh, Galatians 6, 7, Do not be deceived, for the Lord is not mocked. For whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Mm -hmm. And we can receive God's blessings, but unfortunately, the consequences of sin can still remain. Uh, but we still have hope in Jesus. Mm -hmm. Thank you so Amen. much. Yeah. Now, as we continue on in the lesson, we don't have time to read all of the verses, um, but there's many examples of dysfunction continuing on in this family. Um, we see that after he marries Leah, then he is given Rachel and he works another seven years. And then there starts to be this competition between Rachel and Leah about <laughs> who's going to give Jacob the most children and who is he going to love the most. And we see that at first, Rachel has no children. Yeah. And Leah has son after son after son, but she's not receiving love from Jacob. Mm -hmm. um, God is giving children to, to try to um, encourage a love relationship, but um, Jacob is not giving that to her. And then Rachel gives her servant and says, maybe I can have children through my servant, mm -hmm. um, kind of like her grandmother did, um, right? And then um, after Leah stops bearing children, she gives her servant and says, well, now I'm going to continue having kids through my servant. And it's just a big mess. Mm -hmm. Child after child, born from multiple women, all of this jealousy and competition happening. And what can we learn from that? How does God work in the midst of all of our dysfunction? We have dysfunction in our lives too, right? We keep making some of the same mistakes in our lives and other people might look at it and be like, can't you learn by now? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but what can we learn about God and, and how he deals with Jacob and his family through all of this dysfunction, Sabina? Mm -hmm. You know, for me, what's startling is the contrast of what has been God's promise and covenant to Jacob and even to the other patriarchs, because God directly says that he's going to bless all the families of the earth. Mm -hmm. In comparison to their own attitude, everything that they are doing are just bringing suffering and hurt to each one of the family members. There is no one family member here that is not living with a hurt. Mm -hmm. So I think that the main lesson we have to follow through is, yes, God, he, he can repair he can make things beautiful out of the dust and he'll make something new, but you are better off if you just s stay waiting on his promise yes. because there, there was one encounter with Jacob that he had was enough for everyone to be happy and blessed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's a lesson for us also that we are going to seek to abide and obey and be guided mm -hmm. by God so that we are not going to hurt ourselves and those around mm -hmm. us. That's a wonderful lesson to remember. Yes, Jesus. Yeah, I'd like to read a scripture if I could. Sure. It's found in the book of Isaiah, the 55th chapter and 11th verse. Isaiah it ties into this. 11. Yeah. Let's go there. Yes. And so the Bible says, So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. Mm -hmm. It shall not return to me void. Mm -hmm. It shall accomplish what I please and it shall prosper in the thing which I have sent it. And so speaking about that, even the uh, earlier verses, God says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways. So even in the dysfunctional, this dysfunctionality that's going on, God still is going to have his word, which he gave to Amen. Abraham mm -hmm. to be performed. You know, regardless of what's going on, God is so miraculous in his ways. He's making ways happen that we can't see behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be accomplished because his word is going to do just that. That's right. Amen. Beautiful, beautiful. Yes. As we continue on in the story, we see um, that Jacob actually works for Laban several more years. He wants to go back to his family and Laban's like, no, God's blessed me because you've been here working for me. <laughs> right. So he works another six years and for a total of 20 years, he works for his uncle. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, he says, it's time to go home. And, and we could read um, the account, but we don't have time, where we see that God actually directs him again. Mm -hmm. Just like he met him on, on his way to um, Haran, now he's meeting him again, and he says, it's time to go home. I'm going to be with you. Don't worry. I have a plan. And Jacob says, okay. 
Amen. And he actually surrenders and he follows that plan. And so we see a change happening in Jacob throughout all of the lessons that he's learned, um, the deception that he's done and now he's had done to him um, and the dysfunction that he's experienced. But he's learning that God is with him and that God will guide him if he puts his trust in him. Amen. And may each one of us learn that for our lives today. Like Sabina was saying, we don't have to go through all of that pain and suffering if we just grab onto God's hand and follow his plan for our lives. So may each of us, no matter where we are in our lives, may we surrender and give it all to God. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Brittany. What a powerful study. And we're so glad that you were with us for our study today as we continue our series on the book of Genesis. God has a good plan for your life. Trust him and follow his leading. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you that even through family dysfunctions and blatant mistakes, that you still are faithful to your promises, that you work out a good plan. We ask you to forgive us where we have done foolish things, but please, mm -hmm. Lord, fulfill your promise and lead us mm -hmm. in the way everlasting. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Known as the teardrop of the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka is well known for its colorful culture. It embraces a variety of traditions, beliefs, and spiritual practices. A large percentage of the country follows Buddhist practices. Buddhism is the fourth largest religion in the world, with over 520 million followers. Victoria lives in the city of Colombo. She's a retired teacher who chose to return to the classroom. Retirement didn't stop her from using her skills to help one of the most unreached people groups in society. Victoria saw an opportunity to minister to children with special needs by providing a free education curriculum just for them. Our goals, it is helping our uh, church and helping our members to become involved and helping the community and helping autistic children. And this will bring them at last to the church. For several years, Victoria used her sister's house to teach parents and their kids, but she really wanted to build a school. She partnered with the Adventist Church, and they have named the school Zion. This school operates on donations and has endured many financial challenges. Through faith and perseverance, the school has earned recognition and appreciation from parents who found the curriculum suited for their children. Our teachers was very amazing. They are well knowledge about autism, uh, special needs children, and they are very kind. I believe they can develop the children's behaviors and knowledge. They can do something very different here. These teachers didn't come here trained for this type of education. They received training from Victoria for several months before they ran their own classrooms. I am a person who doesn't have so much of patience, but I developed my patience while uh, I was working in Zion Preschool with the kids. With the grace of God, I have to say that I uh, managed to do well with the kids. Um, trust in God and you can do anything with Him. I cannot say how much these teachers are caring for my child. They are very dedicated teachers. Classes founded in love and care are making a big impact on the children and parents at this school. Please pray for Victoria and all the teachers who are involved with these wonderful kids. Pray for more people to be reached through Christ's method of ministry by meeting needs. Thank you for supporting Global Mission, which reaches out to unreached people groups like this.
What a wonderful lesson study as we went through the Word of God. Join us now as we head into our service with our songs of praise.
My name's Eleanor Elias. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are able to come to you on this Sabbath day to worship you and ask for your blessing on our church community. We thank you for loving us, for choosing to forgive us, and though we may not deserve it, for giving us mercy for what we have done. We are also grateful that you are a God in full control of everything in our world, and we thank you for showing us daily your ultimate power over everything that happens here. We remember today those in Ukraine suffering from the awful conflicts happening there and in the surrounding countries. We pray that you will have your guiding hand over those fighting for Ukraine and that you will keep them safe. We also keep in mind the ongoing pandemic. Lord, we need you to help contain this virus and help the st stop the constant spread of it. We pray that you will help the governments around the world, along with us personally, to make the best decisions and guide us in everything we do. And Lord, we remember those today who are struggling with the loss of loved ones those who are suffering from illness and those who are finding life difficult at the moment. We pray that you will keep these families and individuals under your care and that they will remember that you are always there, that their lives are under your control and that whatever you have planned for them is what is ultimately best. We ask that you will help those struggling with their faith at the moment, those that may be beginning to doubt or question their faith in you. We pray that you will help guide them back to you and show their friends and family how best to help bring the back their faith. And finally, Lord, we thank you for your word that has been spoken to us today and every Sabbath. We thank you that we have these facilities to stay connected with our church family and with you. We thank you that you have shown us that Jesus will come one day and take us to be with him in heaven with you. We pray that you will bless us today and in the upcoming week. 
and that we will always remember that you are right next to us when we need you and when we may feel that we don't. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. you to keep your head up to stay positive and be blessed and remember that Jesus is still the answer for the world today for your world for my world for our world today and he's got the whole world in his hands be blessed Happy Sabbath, my beloved friends and brethren. I'm so happy to be with you here today and to speak to you from the Word of God. I also bring you greetings from the administration and directors and members of staff of the British Union Conference. Uh, We want you to know that we are praying for you every single day. Today our message is entitled, Predicament or Responsibility. As an exciting, young intern, full of energy and and, and zest, I, I took a group 
of campers, young people, to a camp in the jungles of Guyana, South America. As we were there camping, doing the, the arts and crafts of, of pathfindering and master guiding, uh, suddenly uh, the cry came that a young man was not there. He was unaccounted for. Inevitably, he was lost. I quickly gathered a group of fellow young people. Um, other others were willing to come along who were not afraid of the, the snakes and, and the wild animals of the jungle. And we began a frantic search for him. To us, he was in a predicament and we had a responsibility to find him before he was injured. Well, we ourselves were in a predicament because we had allowed him to, to escape somehow and we don't know, you know, where he was. We had put all the protocols in place, but yet he had managed to get lost. He should have never been on his own. Notwithstanding all of that, we still had a responsibility to find him. And we began searching frantically calling his name because we wanted to find him. After about two hours, we found him sitting under a very large tree. He was shivering and shaking from fright, tears streaming down his face, and he was in such an emotional state. He was an emotional wreck because of the experience of being lost. Here is my question to you. Do you see yourself as having a responsibility for the many people, family members, people who you come into contact with every day to let them know about Jesus Christ? Do you have that responsibility? According to the Collins Compact English Dictionary, uh, a commission is a duty given to a person or group to perform, a group of people appointed to perform certain duties, authority to perform certain duties, and to grant authority to someone to perform these duties. I believe that we all have been commissioned by God, by Christ, to perform certain duties. Well, in order for us to understand our commission, we will look at Jeremiah's commission. Then we will look at the commission of Jesus. And then we will look at our commission. And then we will go back to Jeremiah's commission and see in that commission and the reactions to that commission, if that does not really mirror the way we behave and the way we react to the commission that God has given us. So we find in Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 1 to 10, uh, Jeremiah's commission. And I begin at verse 4. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, I be all I cannot speak. For I am a child, the King James says, the New King James says a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am a youth, for you shall go to all the whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to deliver you, says the Lord. And then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have this day set you over the nations and over the kingdoms to root out and to pull down, to destroy and to throw down, to build and to replant. Clearly, based upon the definition of commission, we see that Jeremiah was commissioned. Then we look at Jesus' commission in Luke 4, 16 to 21. And verse 16 says, So he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue 
on the Sabbath and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down and the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him and he began to say to them today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing clearly Isaiah wrote this about Jesus 600 years before he was born and clearly long before he was born his commission was outlined for him he was born into his commission and clearly, as he read there in Luke 16, uh, he, uh, from 16 in Luke 4, 16 to 21, clearly he was commissioned and he knew exactly what he was supposed to do. But what about our commission? So we have examined uh, Jeremiah's commission. We have looked at Jesus' commission. What about our commission? And our commission is found in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And it says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always even to the end of the age. Clearly, Jesus has given us a commission. He says, all authority has been given to, to me. And so I'm passing on authority to you. Go, therefore, teach, preach, make disciples. Help people to know Jesus Christ. Do not see it as a predicament, but see it as a responsibility. He says, go and do. Well, you would agree with me today uh, that, that Jeremiah was commissioned. You will agree with me as well that Jesus was commissioned. And you will agree with me as well that Jesus has commissioned us to go and do. Well, let's examine from Jeremiah's commission. And we will see mirrored in that commission, our commission, and see how we have been fulfilling that commission. Or not fulfilling that commission. So Jeremiah began enthusiastically. He began preaching and, 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 and teaching and, and he began doing so many good things. And he was out there and he was spreading the word and he was preaching the word. But after a while, after a while, as Jeremiah was doing his commission and he was not seeing the results that he was looking for. He was not seeing the results that he was looking for. Jeremiah became discouraged. And how do I know this? Well, uh, Jeremiah 20, 7 and 8 uh, and 14 to 18 gives us a clear reflection of Jeremiah's thought processes as he became severely discouraged and even dis dis distressed. He says, and depressed, he says in verse 7, O Lord, you... Induce me and I was persuaded you are stronger than I and have prevailed. Uh, and in derision, I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me for when I spoke, I cried out, I shouted violence and plunder because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. Because why, why didn't you not kill me from the womb that my mother might have been my grave and her womb always enlarged with me? Why did I come forward from the womb to see labor and travail? And sorrow that my day should be consumed with shame, Jeremiah began to blame God for his failures. He, he began to show signs of, of depression, upset, he was tearful, he was restless, he was agitated, he felt worthless, he, he was down on himself, he felt empty, isolated, unable to relate 
to people. They seem to be no pleasure in life. They no enjoyment in ministry and what he was doing. There was no self-confidence anymore, self-esteem. There was a sense of hopelessness and despair. He probably felt suicidal. You know, he, he was just depressed and and, and he began to, to blame God for everything. He said, even you see that man who brought the news that a man child was born to my parents, even he should be punished because my mother should have been, my mother's womb should have been my tomb. I should have never been born. He got so discouraged with his lack of, of success that he did something that we do sometimes Jeremiah resigned Jeremiah resigned he said God I'm done with this I'm not getting the success that I'm looking for I'm not getting the success that even you had promised. You said, I will tear down, I will build up, I will do all this stuff in my commission, but I'm not getting that success. So I resign. How do we resign? How do we resign from our commission? How do we resign from our uh, commission to go and to teach and to preach and to baptize and to evangelize? We resign by our attitude to evangelism, we say it does not work. It's old fashioned, doesn't work. People don't want to listen. We resign by our actions. We do absolutely nothing. We just go with the flow. Whenever there's entertainment or there's uh, some, some program that we can enjoy ourselves and have fun, we do that, but we do not tell anybody about Jesus Christ. We, how do we resign? We resign by ignoring the constant appeals to get involved. And then there is an intellectual resignation that has occurred when we reason evangelism away. Well, if I don't do it, somebody else will. Oh, well, it's the pastor who has been paid to do this. He should do it. Oh, the elders. Oh, it's the PM leader. We resign. Our resignation takes a form of, of church politics where we no longer seek to win souls for God's kingdom, but instead we put all our energies into who will be the next leader, who will be the next elder, who, who's going to be the next president, uh, uh, how the politics goes on and on. We resign because we have failed once or twice and we say, that's it, I will not do this again. You know, when I uh, came to this a beautiful country, uh, I had to learn to drive all over again. <laughs> uh, because here in the United Kingdom, there are rules and laws and regulations, and I had to get a license. And so while I was waiting for that um, time to do the tests and, and all of the, the things that you have to do to get a new license here, uh, I had this uh, member who was uh, driving me around, helping me out, you know. So every now and then, uh, some member will help me to do some visitations. And then one day, one member was driving me around. And, uh, and, and not, she was not that young, but, um, you know, she, she, she was a matured individual uh, driving me. And I was telling her my woes about this driving test and all of that. And she, she said to me, well, Pastor, could you guess how many times I, I failed my driving test? And I said, oh, now you drive pretty well. I'm going to be outrageous. Uh, it must be two times. She said, no. And I said, okay, good. I'm going to be definitely outrageous. And I'm going to really push it. And I'm going to say seven times you failed. By then I was laughing because I thought that this must be a joke on me because she is driving well. Well, she said, no, Pastor, keep going. Well, I became a bit concerned then about her driving, I guess. I, I looked around. <laughs> I said, okay, I'm going to be extremely ridiculous and say 10 times. And she said, no, it wasn't 10 times. And I said, well, look, I give up. There is no way that you could have failed these many times. And she said, no, I failed uh, 12 times and I passed it on the 13th time. And that for me that day was a lesson in perseverance. That you will fail a driving test 12 times and then pass it on the 13th time. What kept her going and going? It was because 
She had a purpose in mind. She wanted to get that test done because it was important to her. So what about when people close the doors in our faces and they say to us, we don't want to hear anything about God. Or, or they say to us, oh, uh, you know, I don't need this religion thing. Do we give up? Do we stop praying for them? Do we stop sharing with them? We resign when our minds are become close to, 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 close to, to new approaches and methods to do evangelism. We resign when evangelism is not the first thing on the agenda. It is not a lifeblood of the church. It's, it's, it's not a thing that we do. But everything else takes precedence except soul winning. We resign when the dead becomes more important than the living. We resign. We resign. We resign. We resign. Like Jeremiah Sometimes we say, God, you did not know what you were doing when you gave me this commission. Well, so Jeremiah resigned. But the good news about it is that even though Jeremiah had resigned and his was an intellectual resignation because he did not tell anybody, he did not send in his resignation to the pastor of the church board, he did not send any notes to anyone. His was an intellectual resign where he said, I am done with God. I'm not going to do this anymore. I have received only shame and ridicule. However, in Jeremiah chapter 21, Verses 1, 2, 4, 8, and then Jeremiah 29, we see a, a, an emerging story of Jeremiah's commission. The king decided, Zedekiah at that time, that he had not heard from Jeremiah for a long time. He had not heard his voice. His voice was always constantly heard. He was always opposing his uh, plans and, 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 and Jeremiah bringing in God's plans and opposing the king's plans. And, and, and he had not heard him. So he wanted to hear him because he was now in trouble. The Babylonians were knocking on the door to make war with his kingdom. So the Bible says, in Jeremiah 21 and verse 1 of the word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord when King Zedekiah sent him Pashar, the son of Melchiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, saying, Please inquire of the Lord for us, for Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, makes war against us. Perhaps the Lord will deal with us according to all his wonderful works, that the king may go away. And then verse 3 says, And then Jeremiah said to them, Thus you shall say to Zedekiah, Thus shall the Lord God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands, in which you fight against the king of Babylon and the Chaldeans who besiege you outside the walls. I will assemble them in the midst of this city. Verse 8 says, Now you shall say to these people, Thus says the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and of death. He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine and by pestilence. But he who goes out and defects to the Chaldeans who beseech you, he shall live and his life shall be a prize. So Jeremiah had resigned. So what's happening here? Somebody will say. Well, you see, even though Jeremiah had resigned from his commission, God had not resigned from him. And when Jeremiah opened up his mouth, when he opened up his mouth, to speak, to tell the messengers that I am no more doing this. I have resigned. I am done with this stuff. I'm done with this prophesying. I'm done with this soul winning. I'm done with this evangelism thing. I'm done with this messaging thing. There was something that was happening inside of Jeremiah. And Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 9 tells us what was happening in him. In verse 9, he says, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word is, was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. So when Jeremiah opened his mouth 
God was still with him. God had not left him. God had not left him in spite of the fact that he had ranted and raved against God and accused God of, of, of being more powerful than him and forcing him into ministry and into his commission. And all of that, God had forgiven him and God had stayed with him. And when Jeremiah saw that God was still with him, Jeremiah resigned with God. He first of all resigned when he was not getting the results that he was looking for. And now that God was still with him, he resigned with God. How do we resign when we have lost our way in our commission? How do we resign? We resign by acknowledging that it is futile to run from God. If he's not glorified by you, he will be glorified upon you. We resign by saying, God, whatever you want me to do, I will do. Why not for once, my friend, not do what you want to do, but what God wants you to do? How do we resign? We resign by revival and, and repentance and reformation. We resign by a consecration of our minds to the things of God. We resign by allowing God to kindle a burning fire within us, shut up in our bones that we cannot help but witness to people. We cannot help but tell our friends and our family that responsibility of our commission rests upon us that we should tell someone about Jesus Christ. We resign by rising above self-pity because failure is an attitude, not just an outcome. That door that has been closed in your face so many times, the rejection that you receive from people because you tell them about the word of God and you try to help them to know Jesus Christ, that should not make you resign. It should make you keep going because God is doing something, is working something in you and in others. We resign by changing our negative thought patterns about evangelism to positive ones. Because success comes by, uh, by going from failure to failure without losing enthusiasm. We resign. We resign by learning from our experience. You see, failure isn't failure unless you learn nothing from it. So today you may have resigned. Today you might... Uh, be thinking uh, this thing about evangelism and witnessing and sharing Jesus is just a waste of time. Maybe you might be thinking intellectually, somebody else is going to do it. I'm going to just go to church and have a nice time and, 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 and sing and give God praise and go back home. And I wouldn't tell anybody, my family members, nothing about Jesus. Well, I want you today, if you have resigned, to resign with God. Resign with God. So here, Jeremiah is now resigned with God. And once you resign with God, God always has more work for you. He always has something for you to do. Because you have to understand that effort belongs to us, but success belongs to God. What God wants us to do is to put in the effort, to do what he says, to share what he has given us in our heart, to let people know our story, our life story about what Jesus Christ has done for us, about sharing our witness about what Jesus Christ has done for us. And it is God and the Holy Spirit that changes people's hearts. But God needs our voice. He needs our touch. He needs our hearts. He needs our faith. He needs our prayers. He needs our enthusiasm to reach people for his kingdom. So once Jeremiah had resigned with God, God had work for him to do. Jeremiah chapter 22 and verse, uh, verses 1 to 9 says, Thus the Lord, uh, Thus says the Lord God, Go down to the house of the king of Judah, and there speak this word, and hear, say, 
Hear the word of the Lord, O King of Judah. You who sit on the throne of David, you and your servants, your people who enter these gates. Uh, thus says the Lord, execute judgment and righteousness and deliver the plunder out of the hand of the oppressed. Do no wrong and do no violence to the stranger, the fatherless or the widow, nor shed innocent blood in this place. For if you indeed do this thing, then shall enter the gates of this house, riding on horses and in chariots, accompanied by servants and people, kings who sit on the throne of David. But if you will not hear these words, I swear by myself, says the Lord, that this house shall become a desolation. God had a specific message now for the king, and he says, Jeremiah, you have been prophesying way out there in the country areas. But I want you to go down to the city now. I want you to go down to the house, the seat of power. So Jeremiah is reassigned. He first of all resigns because he was not getting the results that he was looking for. When he recognized that God had not resigned on him, but God was still with him, he resigns with God. And now he's reassigned. He is sent on a different mission with the same message. He is sent to a different place, but the message remains consistent. And God wants to reassign each of us. Maybe we have been beating uh, one drum, beating one path, but now God wants us to do something different for him. He wants to send us someplace different. He wants us to try a new method, try something different to win souls for him. How do we resign? Be resigned by trying a different method, a different way, by clinging, but clinging to the same old gospel. We resign by establishing new goals because failure is an opportunity to begin again, but more intelligently. Uh, we resign, uh, we are reassigned by acknowledging that human limitations are not important because God is bigger than our limitations. God will reassign us when we realize that God always enables his witnesses to speak his word with power. God wants to reassign us. Maybe today you may have been going through some stuff and you're stuck. God has a new mission for you. He has a new vision for you. Maybe you've been going over the same old, the same old, the same old. God wants to do something new in your life. He wants to do something new with your passions. He wants to do something new with your dreams. He wants to do something new in your neighborhood, using you to do something new at your job, using you to, to do something new for your friends and your family. He wants to reassign you with the same message, but a different method. In Thrapes, France, Colonel Arnold Baltrami, 44, a French police officer, offered up himself to an Islamic extremist gunman in exchange for a hostage. The extremists had taken over a supermarket in France. And Colonel Beltrami decided that he must act. Because those hostages were in a predicament, but he had a responsibility. And so he decided that he would go hands in the air, approach the supermarket with a terrorist, and tell them to exchange an hostage for him. He did not know which hostage will be exchanged, but he was, not, he was not concerned about that. He was concerned that he wanted to save, even if possible, one life. And so Beltrami approached the supermarket. The terrorists quickly grabbed him and pulled him inside and let go a young lady. He never had the opportunity to meet this young lady. He does not, he did not know her name. He would never know her name because immediately as they pulled him in to that supermarket and the hostage was clear away, they shot him. On that fateful Saturday, 
they call him a, a hero. The French President Emmanuel Macron said that he was a man of exceptional courage, a national hero, that he was selfless, that he had volunteered himself, not knowing what the outcome would be. He says that France will never forget his heroism, his bravery, his sacrifice. See, Arnold Beltrame died in the service of the nation to which he had already given so much. By giving his life, another life was saved. His family called him a hero. Even though he had no chance, he went there and he gave his life. About 2,000 years ago, the greatest hero of all, Jesus Christ, stepped up on a hill called Calvary, dragging a bloody cross up that hill, battered and bruised and bleeding. He was going up the hill of Calvary so that he could give his life for you and I. To him, it was not a predicament. It was a responsibility. Because mankind was in trouble and they needed a savior. Oh, this beautiful poem says, there stands an endless mercy tree, very broken, Weary soul, find your rest and be made whole. Stripes of blood that stains its frame shed to wash away our shame. From on a hill called Calvary, scars pure love released salvation by the mercy tree. In the sky between two thieves hung the blameless Prince of Peace, bruised and battered, scarred and scorned, sacred head pierced by all thorns. It is finished, was his cry. The perfect lamb was crucified. His sacrifice of victory, our Savior chose the mercy tree, hope when dark that violent day, the whole earth quaked at a love's display. Three days silent in the ground, this body born for heaven's crown, on that bright and glorious day when heaven opened up the graves, he's alive and risen indeed. Oh, praise him for the mercy tree. Death has died. Love has won. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus Christ has overcome. He has risen from the dead. One day soon we'll see his face. Every tear he'll wipe away. No more pain or suffering. Praise him for the mercy tree. On a hill called Calvary stands an endless mercy tree. Christ died for our sins so that we can have life and have life more abundantly. He paid the ultimate price for us. What is the price that you are prepared to pay to help someone to know Jesus Christ, whom to know is life eternal? Is it a predicament that God has called you to be a soul winner? Or is it a responsibility? For me, it's a responsibility. What about you? If this is your commitment, that you want to be a soul winner for Christ, that you want to share the love of God with somebody else, I want you to bow your heads with me as we pray. Father, we thank you for your words to us today. God, please do above our asking and change us so that we can see in the lives 
of every person we meet, that commission that you want us to help them to know Jesus Christ. And give us the willingness, in spite of us, in spite of the failures we may have encountered or the failures we may encounter as we do this great work, help us to persevere, knowing that at the end, Jesus Christ will save people. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. What a wonderful message from the Word. As we close our day, let's say our final song of praise. <laughs>